Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Greg Gilligan. I'm the Vice President for Operations here at RVA 757 Connects. Uh, thank you for joining us on this rainy afternoon uh, for the latest edition of our RVA 757 Connects Innovation Spotlight webinar series. We have a very informative uh, uh, webinar this afternoon about turning ideas uh, hatched at various universities into, uh, into reality. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping matters. First of all, let me talk to you about what our, our agenda will be for the day. We're going to give you a quick update on RVA 77 Connects. Then we'll delve right into today's topic about, you know, accelerating innovation through university tech transfer. We'll get an overview presentation on the tech transfer offices from one of our speakers. And then after he speaks, we'll, we'll hear from all three of our speakers, including him, one from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, from William & Mary, and from Old Dominion University. Uh, and each will give us a, a presentation on what's happening at their respective universities. Then we'll turn it into a panel discussion. And then finally, we'll leave some time at the very end for questions and answers, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, as a reminder, we always uh, uh, record these, uh, these Innovation Spotlight webinar series. Um, they'll be available later this afternoon. And also, if you have any questions for the panel, uh, please use the chat function so that we can uh, facilitate questions that way. Let me tell you, uh, first off, RVA 717 Connects is a nonprofit organization, so we really rely on donations, mostly from our corporate sponsors. Here are, are, are our corporate investors this year, and we thank them immensely for their support. Let me tell you a little bit more about RVA 757 Connects. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to the improving the economic success and quality of life for everyone in the Richmond region, which we call RVA, and the Hampton Roads region, which is called 757. We are a network of leaders representing businesses, community, and higher education. We are advancing the Richmond to Hampton Roads mega region as the I-64 Innovation Corridor. Our relationship can be packaged in several different ways. We're, we're regional collaborators, for instance. We can, we're considered the 12th largest mega region in the United States. And we're an innovation corridor uh, that we call the I-64 Innovation Corridor. As you can see, we have a variety of uh, different priorities uh, that we're pursuing, different uh, 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 initiatives that we're pursuing. And you can find out about uh, all of these or any of our programs on our website at rva757connects.com. One of our key pro top priorities is an effort to get the Richmond to Hampton Roads mega region designated as a global internet hub. What we found is that the world's next global internet hub isn't going just to be one city, but rather a mega region that extends from the Richmond region all the way to Hampton Roads. This three foot by two foot map explains visually how the I-64 Innovation Quarter becomes a global internet hub by combining the digital assets that are found in both regions, both the Richmond region and the Hampton Roads region. We also spent time developing a strategic plan to make this happen, identifying 10 strategies to make the I-64 Innovation Quarter one of the world's recognized global internet hubs. If you go to um, globalinternethub.com website, on the homepage, you can click on the map to get a better idea of our various digital assets. If you would like to have a copy of this map and the brochure that, that relates to it, please email me and I'll send you a copy. One of our another and one of another one of our initiatives is to drive and support greater collaboration and innovation in the mega region. And one way we do that is through our monthly virtual innovation spotlight webinar series. As I mentioned, we record all of our webinars. Today's webinar will be uh, on our website later this afternoon for your viewing. You can also watch any of the webinars we have held since February of 2022. So for the last two years, all of our uh, webinar recordings are on our website. And let me point out that next month, we'll be holding a, a webinar about a Richmond-based company that's revolutionizing agriculture by creating accessible indoor micro farming solutions. Babylon Micro Farms says it's empowering businesses and communities to grow their own food on site all year round. The company's goal is to develop an ecosystem accessible and affordable for vertical farming products. CEO Alexander Olson will be the speaker and he uh, co-founded Babylon Micro Farms in 2017 while he and his co-founder Graham Smith were both students at the University of Virginia. 
Now let's talk about uh, discussing uh, how ideas and innovations and intellectual properties developed within universities are being transferred to businesses and startups and other institutions and turn those into reality. Technology transfer offices at Old Dominion University, at the College of William Mary, and at, uh, Old, at, at VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, serve as a vital bridge between academic research and practical applications in the commercial world. We have a great lineup of uh, speakers to give us an insight into this topic this afternoon. First, we'll have Kevin Leslie. He's the Associate Vice President for Innovation and Commercialization at Old Dominion University. We had planned to hear from Evelina, uh, the Assistant Vice President for Innovation at VCU, but unfortunately, she had a slight medical emergency this week, so she could not join us. Filling in for her is Magda Morgan. She's the Director of Licensing of Tech Transfer and Ventures Office at, at Virginia Commonwealth University. Thank you, Magda, for uh, filling in for us. And then finally, we have Jason McDevitt. He's the Director of Technology Transfer Office at William & Mary. So let me just tell you a little bit about how the program will proceed, proceed this afternoon. Um, we will here get an overview presentation on tech transfer offices from Kevin Leslie from ODU. Then each of our speakers will give us a presentation on what's happening at those universities. So first we'll have we'll hear from Magda from VCU, then we'll hear from Jason from William & Mary, and then Kevin will fi finish up at ODU. And then we will open it up for a panel discussion among the three of them and with me moderating. And then we'll leave some time at the very end for Q and A's. Again, as before I turn the program over to Kevin to give us an overview, just a reminder that if you do have any questions, please use the chat function uh, so that we can use the, you get your Q and A's uh, taken care of at the very end. I will now stop sharing the screen and I will turn it over to Kevin. And Kevin, you're on mute. There yep. we go. Sorry, I was just waiting for the window to move to get there. So, Greg, everybody can see what we need to see and hear what we need to hear. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, this is uh, personally a lot of fun for me uh, to be on this call with my with my call of Virginia's educational system. Um, I have either worked at or gotten degrees from almost all of these institutions on the call today. Um, so it's it's a pleasure to be here and, and again, talking about the work that I really uh, enjoy doing. And I know that we all enjoy doing at the intersection of, of business and science. So um, what I would like to do, just sort of as the first speakers, provide an overview of what tech transfer actually is and means and how we do it why we do it and give you uh, just kind of that primer before we start delving into what each of our individual institutions um, does. So I'm going to start with kind of the classic, what do all these things have in common? Uh, for those of you who didn't know, Honeycrisp apples were in fact invented at a university and uh, went through this process, nicotine patches, Gatorade, prostate uh, antigen tests, um, Again, this is just you know a few examples of thousands upon thousands of inventions that have made their way um, through university halls and then eventually out into uh, the world through the help of the tech transfer process in the offices at those institutions. So I think it's helpful at the beginning just to throw a few definitions out there because a lot of words that come uh, around the tech transfer sphere in particular innovation and commercialization. I think innovation is wielded most broadly, and that's fine. Uh, I just want to make sure that um, we do see that, you know, the innovations are really focused on creating these new and useful things, and commercialization is actually harnessing those and helping to protect and move them out into the world to generate societal impact and, uh, and value. So why do we do this? Um, I, for most people on the call, I think you know, you're aware of the standard examples of a technology may come out of an institution and that institution gets some royalties back and everybody's happy. Uh, but it is a little bit more complicated than that. And I'll show you some numbers on the, the following slides that highlight the fact that it's not just about revenue coming back to the institution 
you know, tech transfer offices are deeply embedded in the ecosystems uh, and networks in their regions in particular. And so this is about bringing inventions to, you know, help the greater good and public health in many cases, um, you, know, you know, getting a revenue diversification for the institution, um, building economic development opportunities within a region, within a city, within an institution, creating new partnerships, um, and even for the faculty themselves, providing more opportunity for research and connection as we go. So it's, it's more than just bringing back revenue to the institutions. It has a continued broader impact uh, you know, in, in the regions for these institutions, but also for society at large. So uh, the next two slides, uh, these are pulled from Autumn, which is the professional organization for, um, for my colleagues and I. And I think it's helpful to see that you know, directly or indirectly, technology transfer has a significant impact um, on both scientific research and the broader economic outlook. So these numbers are from you know, an almost 20-year uh, period. Um, but if you look at just the sheer volume um, in the United States of inventions being disclosed um, through our offices, new jobs being created and startups, um, and even just drugs uh, and vaccines. So um, I just wanna highlight kind of the scale of this activity at the national level, just with some of these broader numbers, but also note, you know, as we look at our process, I think it's helpful for you to be able to see kind of how this cycle happens and where our office happens to come in. And I'll say up front, this is what, what I would call kind of the nuts and bolts of tech transfer when you think historically about um, the role that these offices serve. Um, it's identifying and protecting and marketing um, and developing intellectual property. Um, but our offices, you know, they're, they're slightly different flavors at every institution. Every, every institution does it a little bit differently. But now tech transfer offices have kind of expanded their roles into further supporting this process from an educational standpoint uh, for faculty, from a programmatic standpoint. Uh, even running, you know, seed funds or, you know, similar pools of funding to continue to push technologies forward. So it, it goes beyond just the intellectual property identification and protection um, and then marketing and licensing. We've really started to, to grow. But uh, what I'll say is if you look at that invention block, that's kind of the first, um, first step for us broadly when we engage with a faculty member. And this is, you know, at a point where a faculty member says, I think I might have something. Uh, and this is the invention disclosure process where they notify us uh, with as much detail as they can why they think that's the case and what it may be. And that starts this ball rolling um, of our offices working closely with the faculty to understand, okay, what do you have? How far along is this? Um, if we're thinking about commercialization in particular, these early stages are critical because if you disclose these kinds of things publicly, that can start certain clocks that become problematic a few years out if you actually wanna take this thing forward. So we, we strategize with them about how to publish and talk about their work in addition to thinking about the commercial opportunities. Um, and then from a, a protection standpoint, we think about what else is out there uh, and what changes might be made to that intellectual property to strengthen it from a protective element. Um, and then start getting into the process for actually filing for provisional patents and full, uh, full patents um, and ultimately marketing and licensing those technologies out to existing companies or startups that may have formed uh, with founding members from the university teams or kind of a, a mixture of both um, from a regional ecosystem. But generally, the two primary outcomes are going to be uh, licensing to a larger existing company or licensing um, out to a startup. And so that's kind of the, the arc of our nuts and bolts for tech transfer. But in all of that, all these interactions with faculty, we um, have a lot of educating to do. There are a lot of rules we have to follow in doing that. Um, but I don't want to delve too deeply in there, but just to help you understand that we kind of follow this um, all the way all the way through. So if we flip that and think about this from kind of just a single technologies perspective, um, there's a lot going on in this figure, but I just want you to see kind of where we fit in the spectrum of a technology maturing over time. So our offices generally spend most of our time in kind of this first column in research and development, and then a little bit into field validation and demonstration. 
and then a little bit less in scale up and commercial launch. And this is really, you know, this is a, a team effort. There are a lot of folks that I'll talk about that participate in this um, process. And this is also not, um, again, a, a fixed time frame. Depending on the technology you have, some of these could be, you know, a year, year and a half long. Sometimes it could be a decade or more. And so I think it's really important, too, to understand that the range of technologies and intellectual property that we encounter is pretty significant. And so uh, we have to make sure that we, uh, both from the educational side and from the actual strategy side, um, acknowledge and support that uh, appropriately. And the last thing I'll note is that we talk a lot about the technologies themselves, but just like for venture capital and other kinds of um, early stage investing, you look at more than just the technology, right? Somebody has to actually take this forward um, and uh, help continue to develop the technology. In some cases, form the you know founding team for a startup company. Um, we have to look at what the broader sort of macroeconomic conditions are, if they have traction in their scientific field. So there are a lot of other pieces outside of just the technology in a vacuum that we look at as we think about developing the strategies for both protecting and then marketing and um, moving that technology forward. So I'll also note there are some rules that we have to follow. Uh, this is the, the, this is a 30 second primer on kind of those levels. Obviously, Baidol is the one you might most be familiar with uh, from 1980. And this really uh, established a set of uniform guidance and enabled institutions like academic research institutions to uh, own and protect and license and, and market the intellectual property that they developed using um, federally funded programs uh, for research. So we have a broader federal umbrella, uh, Virginia state law and CHEV has regulations for how we handle uh, reporting and, and um, you know, using state resources and, and covering broadly for our institutions, how we're supposed to behave. And then every university has its own policy for its faculty members, its students, its staff um, that spells stuff out in detail for how they're supposed to go through the processes internally. And um, uh, one of the things people usually focus on is also the revenue split. If something is successful and revenue does come back to the institution, how does that get um, divvied up among the inventors, the colleges, et cetera? So I mentioned that this is not um, this is not a solo effort. Our tech transfer offices are very diverse teams in and of themselves, but we are also enmeshed in this sort of web of partners in order to move this forward. So you know we play a strong role, but our academic partners on the faculty side, uh, we have you know mentors and industry partners we engage with uh, regularly. Um, the legal and regulatory consulting that we get because every technology, particularly in healthcare. Um, is is unique and requires a lot of uh, fine tuning. Um, and then obviously investors and the startup support organizations that help move these things once they um, leave our doors. So uh, the last few things I wanna talk about, um, first is just how we even measure success. Uh, these metrics on the left are, uh, I think the more traditional ones, right? That are focused on primarily volume. How many new things are coming through the funnel uh, every year? How many patents are we um, uh, applying for? How many of those are getting awarded? How much licensing revenue is coming back? And how many startups are we spinning out? Um, I think we're starting to see a little bit of a trend, both you know, through Autumn, through NSF, there, you know, a focus beyond just those traditional metrics and trying to understand, okay, how many jobs are coming out of this? Uh, what does this do to the reputation of the institution and, and the departments? Um, how is the societal impact actually getting measured? So these are more nascent metrics, but they're things that are starting to get a little bit more attention beyond um, those traditional few. So um, I do wanna note that it's uh, not all smooth sailing, right? We have, uh, this is a really complex process and I just wanna highlight that there are uh, a couple big categories that we'll probably get to later uh, that are um, particularly challenging. So faculty are often not just doing research. Um, they might be teaching, they're trying to write and publish and get additional funding, get tenure. Um, so we are competing for their, their time. And again, the resources to continue to develop these technologies. And this also exists within the broader academic um, culture and trying to find 
um, folks who have the appetite for being able to participate in this on a regular basis. Um, and then the other thing I note is that different ecosystems are more mature, right? If you look at, um, you know, there are some institutions that don't have any tech transfer offices, and then you have an ecosystem like Boston with MIT and a really long history, decades worth um, of this kind of activity. So that is, that's another significant variable and kind of the volume that you'll see in these institutions. So the last thing I'll say in the overview is that we actually have a really great substrate within our region. We have a lot of really productive research institutions. We have a lot of great partners and startup support organizations. We have federal partners within you know, Jefferson Lab, NASA Langley, um, and existing organizations that kind of tie some of these together. So um, I just wanted to say we're actually in a very good position regionally at the state level, you know, a lot of the support that we talk about is sort of this in-between funding of things that have a lot of potential, but need a little bit more of a boost and dedicated uh, time and resources to, to flesh it out. Um, so Vipsy and Catalyst are obviously big supporters of that. But then we also have groups like the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative that are focused on generating innovations to feed into this funnel. Um, so I think it's useful to see what things we have supporting this process, but it's also interesting to see what is actually feeding it um, from the innovation side. And then at the federal level, again, I would just note that NSF is a really big uh, proponent and partner in this, both in terms of the funding mechanisms that they have, but also the educational opportunities and programs. And then obviously you're starting to see more funding come out from the uh, you know funnel generation side to push more innovations out um, as we go. So uh, I will pause there stop sharing my screen and uh, turn it back over. Kevin, thank you so much. That was uh, real interesting. I didn't realize uh, hunting Chris came out of a tech transfer office and stuff. So I'm sure there's a backstory about that, but, and also thanks for mentioning as, as Magdalena, as Magda um, uh, gets her slides ready and stuff. Uh, thank you for mentioning some of those uh, partners that you referred to like Activation Capital and 757 CoLab and Go Virginia and VIPC are all on this call today. So it's, it's good that they're they're uh, represented. So Magda, I will turn over to you. You are uh, muted, but if you'll unmute yourself, yes. then we'll go yes. to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me uh, on a very short notice. I just found out yesterday that I will be presenting. So if I say something inappropriate, please forgive me. Uh, I will try to represent um, Evelina and the office appropriately. So I'm, the, I'm Magda Morgan, I'm Director of Licensing at VCU Tech Transfer and Ventures. And I will tell you a little bit about our office and how we look, what we do, how we do it, and how, what are our metrics and how we look in numbers as, as Kevin mentioned before. Is this not? Oh, no, it's moving. So I want to start, the first two slides I have is actually show to showcase the products uh, that are currently on the market that came from VCU that were started here by our faculty. Uh, we have a range of different products like uh, diagnostic assay for systemic mastocytosis, which is currently the only approved assay around the world for that, for, uh, the, that uh, particular testing. We have a Lyme disease vaccine for dogs that was developed um, by Zoetis, which is the animal part of Pfizer. We have bandages, we have ELISA tests, but as you can see, we also have not medical and not therapeutic products. Anything from consumer products like uh, Swim P3, which is used to listen to music underwater, to uh, children accessories, but also uh, clothing line for children with cancer. We have uh, drug delivery devices, Crawler for crawlers for children in all different areas of research. Um, we have products. I apologize for the sirens outside. Kevin kind of touched up a little bit about what uh, tech transfers really, what's the role of our offices. Here at VCU, the three main areas of our focus is commercialization, which includes not only IP protection and validation and maturation of technologies, but also sparking industry collaboration, collaboration and internal collaboration between departments, between schools and colleges, which is very important for innovation. Uh, our education and outreach, we 
try to educate people not only about intellectual property commercialization, but also about entrepreneurship and the benefits of uh, working with tech transfer offices. And one of our newest roles, uh, maybe two, three years, new venture support, where we uh, help faculty and VCU members to start their own companies, companies that are based on VCU technologies. And I will tell you a little bit more about it at the end of my talk. Here is how we look in the numbers. So in the past 10 years, we brought over 54 products to the market. We helped more than 60 startups to be formed. And we brought more than 37 million in licensing revenues. And that revenue is being shared not only with the inventors, but also with schools and colleges to incentivize working with us. And the number that we are very proud of is 700 over 700 industry engagements. And those are efforts put into bringing industry here to VCU, showcasing what we have, showcasing our research area, our strengths to build the relationship and spark collaboration and then future partnership and bringing those products to the market. So speaking of startups, as I mentioned before, we have almost 60 startups in the past 10 years. And as you can see, 77% of them are here in Virginia, which is very challenging because, you know, we are not, we, we would like them to be to come from Virginia, but there's not a lot of resources, especially in therapeutic uh, spaces. They are growing, so we are very happy about it, but we are very proud that of the fact that a lot of them stays in the region. And another great metric is anybody who has anything to do with startups know that the lifespan of a startup is a, is a very touchy subject and a lot of them just fail after a couple of years. And over 80% of our startups are still active and actively developing the product. Those companies brought more than 97 million in funding, whether dilutive or non-dilutive funding, in the past 10 years, and they have 11, market, 11 products on the market. And below you can see some of our companies that were created here at VCU. When you look at the breakdown and where, which areas of research our startups usually are, it's not a surprise that therapeutic and medical devices is really a big majority of what we have here. But our software, Technologies and companies are growing rapidly. When we compare this pie chart to five years ago, the software was a tiny little piece of this pie, which shows us that that's where really is kind of uh, undiscovered territory. And we see more and more from all sorts of different research area, whether it's a school, medical school or engineering or education, art, and um, all that, which, which is very exciting because those startups might not be easier, but sometimes they might be quicker to market than the therapeutic and medical devices, obviously. About our venture support, um, Gerard Eldering is heading kind of efforts in our office for the venture support. And I know it's a very busy slide, but what I really want to highlight is that we have multiple resources for our faculty and staff who wants to start a company or who wants to be involved in starting a company. We have Entrepreneur in Residence program where we work with entrepreneurs from all over the country really to help and mentor and provide support. We have, uh, we can help with federal uh, and state um, grants like SBIR, STTRs. We have networking events. We have one-on-one -on -one mentoring. We have advisory board and many, many other resources. And here you can see the organizations that we partner with to help provide all those resources for our startups. And um, recently, last month, actually, we launched our first accelerator. And when I say our first, it is really just formalizing what we've been doing all along um, till that day. But we launched our pilot uh, cohort of five startups, uh, those startups get paired with one-on-one -on -one entrepreneurs and residents, one or two or three, depending on the need. And they are being coached and they are developing all sorts of commercialization plan, business plan, pitch competition and stuff like that. And planning maybe late April, early May, we will have a pitch competition event where one or two may win um, prizes, though those startups and move on to the next level, which we are very excited um, about. And we are already looking 
for the next cohort uh, to join the, the accelerator. And that's really all I have about VCU. Here is our team and Evelina is in the dress here. So you can imagine she has very similar accent to me. So you can imagine that she was speaking really. Um, and I will take any question either now or later. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Magda. Uh, we'll do some questions at the very end uh, and stuff. That that's uh, you, you, some of the top products that you mentioned uh, were were fast day. It was very interesting. Now we'll turn it over to Jason um, from William and Mary. He will give us an overview of what's happening there. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, so. I'm going to start with the mission statement of our office, uh, which is always a breathtakingly exciting way to start off a talk, but uh, hopefully it allows me to make a broader point about what we're trying to accomplish. And essentially, our mission is to transfer the intellectual output of our research in a manner that benefits the public. So sure, we are very happy to enter into lucrative licensing deals when we get the chance, uh, but we're also very happy to freely give away our technologies if that makes more sense to do so, and that's often the case. So only about 25% of university tech transfer offices are actually profitable in a given year after all expenses and payouts to inventors. And fortunately, every year we're one of them, but like most university tech transfer offices, uh, our mission is much broader than generating income. So my background perspective for this talk uh, is that I've worked in R&D and new business development for very large companies, uh, founded and run several startups, and I've been in tech transfer for a long time. And in these various roles, I have negotiated and conducted licensing and R&D deals, uh, both with and from big companies, startups, universities. And one of the things I often hear is how difficult it is to work with universities. And I work with universities all the time, and I couldn't agree more. Universities can sometimes be very slow to respond, uh, inflexible, maybe greedy, inconsistent. Here's the thing, though. The same can be said for some big companies and startups and also small companies, VCs, government agencies. And that's just the reality. So your choices are really to deal with it or in maybe some cases find a different partner. And so if you go that route, please consider Women, Mary, uh, where we certainly try to be a good research and licensing partner. So most big money licenses in university tech transfer uh, have historically been biomedical technologies. Uh, at Women Mayor, we don't have a med school, uh, don't have an engineering school. So our technology pool is perhaps a little more varied and less concentrated than you'd see at a lot of other universities. Um, that said, we have had success in some of the traditional tech and biomedical fields. Um, for example, if you've ever watched the TV show Silicon Valley about a fictional tech startup, uh, that company's core technology was a better data, data compression algorithm. And we've actually got the real thing with one of our startups, which is called CocoPie, uh, which has developed improved compression and compilation technologies, which facilitate uh, real-time AI execution. Another license is for a sleep apnea monitoring technology, uh, which is used now in natal, uh, neonatal intensive care units. Uh, as another example, actually, uh, we're about to license to a spinoff in partnership with VCU, a very cool wearable technology that detects and prevents freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, another women Mary startup called Oxlin is selling a nutraceutical product, product for people with diabetes. And that's the first acute treatment to augment insulin during hyperglycemic episodes uh, to reduce their duration and magnitude. So we've also had uh, success licensing and commercializing technologies of a, a more eclectic variety. And one thing a lot of those technologies have in common is that they produce a significant environmental benefit. Uh, so, for example, we have a bird deterrent technology called Sonic Nets, uh, which is used to keep birds out of your local Home Depot, uh, also away from orchards and runways. Uh, our biodegradable shot shell wads can replace traditional plastic wads that are almost unavoidably littered into the environment with every shot fired downfield. Um, and a good example of a technology that we give away is a modeling product called Schism, uh, which is freely available and is currently used by EPA as its primary model for the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And so speaking of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, arguably our greatest licensing success is improved oyster brood stock uh, from our affiliate, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And so personally, I live very close to Jamestown Island. And when John Smith first arrived on the scene, 
the James River was, quote, very beautiful and wide, but full of shallows and piles of oyster shells. Uh, and it's still beautiful and wide, but you know, good luck finding the oyster shells. Because unfortunately, as you'll see uh, in this slide, a chart of oyster landings over time in Virginia and Maryland makes for pretty depressing reading. Uh, and that's because of over harvesting, pollution, uh, and disease pressure. And in fact, the oyster population in the Chesapeake Bay uh, actually dropped to less than 1% of historic levels. And that's really bad because it's not only that oysters are a great food source, but they're also crucial to the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem. They provide an enormous service in keeping the bay clean uh, with each adult oyster capable of filtering uh, roughly 50 gallons of seawater every day. And the good news though, is that things are moving in the right direction now. Uh, and our oyster broodstock program has played a big part in that. So we developed disease resistant oysters, uh, also bred for other improved characteristics like faster growth, uh, meteor oysters, um, tolerance to low salinity. And our broodstock is then licensed to hatcheries all over the Chesapeake Bay, uh, as far north as Maryland and Ma Maine and Massachusetts. Uh, the hatcheries then produce baby oysters from our broodstock, which are called odd larvae, uh, and they grow into seed oysters. And on the order of a billion of these odd larvae and seed oysters are uh, sold every year to growers um, who grow uh, to, to table oysters. And that has really helped fuel the uh, oyster aquaculture boom in the Chesapeake Bay region. Our oysters are also used uh, for remote setting to try and restore oyster reefs. And that makes for a healthier and more productive Chesapeake Bay. So the next time you're at an oyster roast or contemplating run off into the bay, uh, you might give a nod to some of our university research that's being transferred uh, for the benefit of the public. So that's it. Great, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. A few will stop sharing your screen there, Jason, and then we'll let uh, Kevin uh, share his screen so he can tell us a little bit more about what's happening at ODU. But uh, uh, Jason, that was, I was really interested about oysters. For those oyster lovers out there, what you all are doing is, is significant. So uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that in the Q&A a little bit. All right, Kevin, you're up and we can see your screen and we will let you go. Okay, thanks. Um, and just keeping an eye on time, I'll try to keep it pretty short here uh, because I think a lot of the sentiments will will be the same which uh, in particular to jason's i think people think a lot about the outcome of, of this process as being a, a licensing deal or revenue generation but a lot of times uh, you know the scale of a technology or an implementation isn't appropriate for that stage but we similarly seek to figure out how we can most benefit the public even in a limited fashion and so i think where we've started to turn culturally is figuring out a way to say, yes, maybe this is not appropriate for a venture backed, you know, uh, startup, but if we're going to build 10 or 15 of a device that's useful to a specific agreements and the structure so people don't lose money on it, we can actually still disseminate those um, and get those out into the real world. So, um, okay, uh, just a few, few quick things. Um, I'm going to take a slide. I will get first, but I think for those who aren't familiar, uh, just with some of the, as I call it, substrate that is uh, available at Old Dominion and, and kind of in the Hampton Roads region, um, there are a lot of these really uh, interesting institutes and sort of interdisciplinary uh, groups for you know space flight, for healthcare, for coastal resilience, for modeling and simulation um, that have contributed a lot to our innovation funnel. Um, in addition to just the traditional uh, research groups and engineering. Um, but uh, again, ODU is a, a pretty big place um, and we're gonna get a little bit bigger as we think about the merger coming up. So I wanted to just talk about a few things really quickly because these kind of change um, how ODU has thought about um, technology transfer, why we've reorganized some things. Um, first, uh, within the last few years, we've gotten an R1 designation, joining tech and VCU, uh, Mason and UVA in the state as uh, being you know, at a high level of research activity. Um, second is obviously the integration with EVMS. Day one um, is July 1st of this year. So we're really excited about that, particularly when we think about um, 
uh, where we are on the trajectory of our growth as an institution. So I, I think VCU is a really great example being, you know, sort of seven to 10 years ahead in having that relationship uh, with you know, a, a health system and all of that kind of clinical collaboration that can happen without as much friction. Um, so we're really excited about the opportunity, particularly from a research standpoint, to be able to, to leverage that. Um, we also just created a new joint institute with Jefferson Lab. So that actually, that's a federal joint institute like Pacific Northwest Labs, um, same kind of model, but we established that with Jefferson Lab uh, just ahead of our designated, uh, designation as a federal supercomputing facility. Um, and then ODU is also rolling out a couple new schools in cybersecurity, data science, supply chain, logistics. Uh, so I just want to highlight a couple numbers really, really quickly. Um, as I said, we're we're kind of on the upward part of that research growth trend. We've had you know over a ten year period about seven hundred and fifty million dollars in research expenditures, um, one hundred ninety six patent applications. 91 of those ultimately uh, got awarded. So again, if you look at that scale relative to our you know, other peer institutions on the call, we have a really strong base, but I think we have a lot of opportunity to grow um, capturing some of those innovations and helping them move forward um, beyond just you know, stamping and, and protecting. So as you would expect, uh, you know, we do have a really strong engineering presence here, um, uh, representation, I should say, across the patent applications and the awarded patents. Um, and I would highlight just as, uh, as others have, um, uh, our kind of deal spotlight, uh, in 2017, one of the biggest deals the institution did was with pulse biosciences. So this was a technology that came, uh, out of the, uh, bioelectric center here that used nanosecond electrical pulses, um, uh, to treat dermatological conditions as well as, uh, cancer and, and some surface tumors. Um, so that was uh, one of the biggest windfalls in the university's um, history and probably one of the most well-known um, from our shop. So I mentioned that we restructured a little bit, and that's partly uh, in thinking about uh, the integration with EVMS, but also trying to bring some functions under one roof. So we have what I would call the nuts and bolts of tech transfer, um, you know, intellectual property agreements and compliance. Um, uh, directly reporting to me uh, within the Office of Research, but we also have the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at ODU, which has kind of had a few different homes over the last 10 years. Um, but really, that is the programmatic support element and economic development arm of a lot of this activity. So when we think about SBIRs and STTRs for faculty and being able to partner with industry, um, they're one of the first places we go. Uh, to initiate that, um, in addition, as I said, to programmatic support across uh, not just not just for faculty, but for uh, regional demographics across, you know, women's business, veterans businesses. Um, so they've got a pretty pretty wide swath there. And I also mentioned a research foundation because the way we're structured, a lot of our licensing activity is actually executed by our foundation. We are a direct partner and party to that process, um, but ultimately the licenses will be executed by the foundation, even if we're uh, in there negotiating some of those terms. And then lastly, our entrepreneurial center, which used to be part of our Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship is actually back under our school of business. So I'm just, for those who have some history with ODU or awareness of them, uh, some of these pieces have shifted around and now we've kind of condensed uh, our Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and tech transfer activities under one umbrella. And so as we, Look forward, um, the university put forward a strategic plan a little over a year ago, and a significant part of that was not just looking at this broader umbrella of technology transfer and entrepreneurship and innovation, but doing that in partnership with uh, our industry partners, federal partners, really trying to um, I, I think people underestimate how important the process side of this is. You know, you can have your your terms, but making it easy and transparent and clear, even if there are going to be negotiations, obviously, through every every deal, um, making it as easy as possible for people to start that interaction and know what to expect. So we're really working through that uh, to make that easier um, to do. And again, as we're looking towards the integration, I think that's going to be a really 
exciting opportunity to supercharge both sides as we think about clinicians identifying problems and trying to find a basic science solution um, and folks on the opposite side looking to be able to test in the clinic and validate some of those ideas. So uh, I think we've got a really um, interesting few years ahead and I'm excited to excited to be here to help with it. And that's all I have. Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. We really appreciate it. Now let's turn to asking the the group that you're you're painting the panel. And again, uh, folks who are there, if you have any questions, use the chat function. But my big question for you all is, and anyone can chime in, but what are the what what are the top challenges? I mean, Kevin, you touched upon this a little bit, but Amanda, what you know, or Kev, Jason, what are some of the top challenges that you guys are, are facing? I mean, where do we start, really? <laughs> um, many, many challenges, uh, and I think every every university deals with similar ones. You know, I think the top one, especially recently, big and I'm talking about more of a pharmaceutical uh, space because that's that's my expertise. But big pharma and medium pharma really want, if they want to partner with university, they really want something that is not early stage. Uh, so that's the challenge because. 99% of our technologies are early stage. And in order to bring it to the next inflection point, we either need to partner with some or someone or start the company to, to, to develop it further and then be of interest to pharma. But that comes with its own challenges because of lack of resources, especially in the pharmaceutical space. Um, faculty cannot run the company because they have a full-time job and running a company is, I feel like 1.5 of full-time jobs. So to find a great management team who knows the space and will find the resources and bring the company quickly, bring the technology quickly to become, uh, you know, uh, attractive to, to pharma to be acquired or purchased is a challenge, especially that our faculty needs to publish. They need to publish, they need to apply for grants. So we need to start patenting process very early that the, the clock is ticking. Uh, so we really need to be on the roll developing this technology. So I think that's the biggest challenge. Uh, and I'm sure Kevin and Jay, well, Jason doesn't have medical school, so maybe not this, the same, but probably it's similar in other areas as well. Jason, what, what challenges are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, sir, sir, we certainly face the same ones um, to a lesser degree. I mean, there's always this difficulty of trying to license early stage stuff and um, funding agencies and you know potential partners always prefer uh, later stage um, technologies and things that have had more validation. And so that, that always is a struggle. Uh, for women, Mary, um, you know, our challenges are probably, uh, you know, certainly different in generally from VCU's challenges, you know, let alone a school like MIT. You know, we, we certainly don't have the technology flow that uh, bigger universities have. Uh, and that's just, you know, a, a fundamental, um, you know, that's, that's, based on our research, our, our size of our institution and the amount of research we do and the kind of research we do. Um, so that's uh, that's always a struggle for women, Mary. Yeah, and I was just going to echo, I mean, to Magda's point, I think the people part of the equation, the bottleneck there is it's not just finding people who are willing to take that risk, but that have the technical expertise to be able to do that. And it doesn't matter if you're in Boston or down here. I mean, it's hard anywhere to do that well. Um, I think one of the other points that was brought up was sort of resourcing some of that gap, right? We have a thing and we need to move it a little bit further forward. And I think over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot more in the way of support at the kind of state and regional level between educational stuff and then non-dilutive funding opportunities internally or broadly, you know, at the state level um, to help identify those and move them forward. So I, I think there's a lot of room for hope on that front. I think the people part of the equation really is one of the trickiest, trickiest to solve. So if we've talked about the challenges, let's do on the flip side. What are some of the uh, big opportunities out there that, that you're seeing, whether it's at your university or generally? I can follow up on Kevin what he what he was talking about when he was talking about support, uh, either federal or state level support. And we work very closely with Dipsy, which is the former CIT, and they've been 
a great supporter and of many in many in many different areas and they have all sorts of uh fundings and resources either for small companies or for our faculty and even for tech transfer offices you know we partner with them for small grants that we can pay for those uh entrepreneurs and residents, and we can provide our faculty with this support. So that's a great opportunity to actually create more state level or even federal level uh, tech transfer support opportunities like that. Yeah, I concur. Certainly Vipsy, um, especially recently, has done a really good job um, in helping to uh, implement some new programs that have been very helpful uh, for our commercialization efforts, um, particularly in the, in, in it's difficult, for example, in Williamsburg, where we don't have the kind of startup infrastructure that you might have in, in Richmond or Virginia Beach. Um, you know, we have more of a, a bifurcated labor pool between retirees and, and students. And, um, and it's very easy maybe to start a business, never easy to start a business, but it's, um, you know, if you have a business that caters to, to serving, you know, students or retirees, um, you know, it's, it's maybe easier in, in Williamsburg, but, um, you know, to try and do a high tech startup or a biotech startup in Williamsburg is really challenging. Um, and so, uh, you know, any, anything that, that helps along those lines is always very welcome. Yeah. And I would just add in, if we're looking at opportunities in specific sectors, um, I think one of the things that Virginia is doing really well when we're looking at, um, you know, healthcare and biosciences data science and cybersecurity, and then autonomous systems, right? These are areas where the state as a whole has a pretty significant advantage, both in terms of labor and the education side. But I also think we're starting to see greater collaboration among the institutions and some of those formally for something, you know, like the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, and then informally as the federal government starts to incentivize that collaboration through mechanisms like NSF engines, even if they aren't getting awarded, we're starting those kinds of conversations and we're just kind of uh, you know, moving faster towards towards those more cutting edge technologies. And, and I the think catalyst, that, you know, the catalyst yeah, grant yeah. that brings together three institutions. So yeah. that's great. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I, the other thing I mentioned is that UBED uh, is now getting revitalized. So that's the university based economic developers group. And so I think you're you're starting to see those connections reform. Um, and so we'll be able to capture those opportunities more collaboratively. So if we can talk just briefly about trends, I know, Matt, you you brought up how you all are seeing a growing trend, if you want to, if we can use that term, towards funding more um, uh, software development. Is is that happening? Is that is it just because it, it it's happening there? Is it happening elsewhere? Is it or what other trends are we we seeing? I think it's starting to happen uh, in a lot of places, actually, because, and it comes, I think, maybe from the lack of education before, a lot of faculty who come to us with those either software-related technologies or educational materials, they didn't realize that that's something they can commercialize. Uh, so we help them understand that software-based and copyright-based technologies are also very easily commercial commercializable. So... We are trying to educate our faculty who is not working in this very typical, you know, medical device and therapeutic space that they know what, what the invention is to convince them that there is value in what they are creating as well, even though it doesn't have the standard patent. So I think that's why we see more and more. And also those, like, like I mentioned, those technologies are much easier to market. J uh, Kevin mentioned that, you know, therapeutic development can take a decade. Software development, we can see an effect and product on the market within a couple of years. Um, so those startups or, you know, and even the regular licenses can benefit much faster. Yeah, and I'd say I, I like Kevin's slide uh, that talked about some of the new metrics uh, to kind of analyze technology transfer. Um, and I agree with that. I think there's, I think uh, most universities, there's an increasing focus on economic development um, and particularly startups. Uh, so I think those are kind of a general trend uh, that there's more activity in those areas. And I think the only thing that I would add from a technology side, uh, it wouldn't be a tech transfer conversation if we didn't mention AI it's somewhere in here, but I think just as an example of the speed of disruption on both sides, right? In faculty coming up with things and, you know, trying to keep up with the gray areas where, you know, can we protect this? Can we not? What's going on? I mean, even, you know, the state actually issued some guidelines for using those tools as 
public institutions um, and how we're supposed to do that, which was which was great. Um, but I think we're seeing the opportunities on our side for how we can tackle some of the brute force stuff that can slow us down using those tools. But then on the other side, as they come up, um, how do we help faculty um, navigate that? Because, you know, it feels like the policies and, you know, they're kind of evolving right alongside the technology or at least behind. So. Let me, uh, there's a question from uh, one of our members of our audience that they want to know if you all can comment on the broader talent pool to support these efforts. He's interested to know if this technology stays locally by and large, or if this is primarily an export to other regions activity, what would make local retention more likely across the region? Hmm. I mean, that's a, that's a complicated, uh, complicated question with a complicated answer. I mean, I think when you look particularly for just high tech in general, or these pools, you know, uh, or a place where this activity happens a lot, right? I'll, I'll use Boston again. You have this hyper connectivity and a lot of lateral moves and this kind of critical mass uh, of, of opportunities for people. And so I don't, I don't necessarily know where that is industry specific and region specific for us, but I think there is this critical mass piece that um, we are still missing, um, so. Yeah, I, mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if you have a tech startup coming out of George Mason in Northern Virginia, um, you know, there's a lot greater chance it's gonna stay local than, you know, biotech coming out of Williamsburg. Um, so that's just kind of the reality of it. Yeah, we definitely see the same trend. Obviously when it comes to the traditional licensing to existing companies, well, that's out of the control where the company is located. That's usually where the technology goes. But when it comes to startup, it really depends uh, if the company stays in a region, if the talent coming surrounding the startup, you know, like the management team or maybe even a funding comes from Virginia. We have some companies that got funding here, either from Virginia Beach or, or Virginia in general, and they stay in the region. But if the entrepreneurs come from somewhere else, they usually have a network, you know, around where they are located. So they bring the startup with them. So it really depends on who is involved. We have another question from Marla from Jefferson Lab, and I'm not quite sure, Marla, if you're, if you're on. She wants to know, can labs and NASA be in UBED? I can, well, Marla and I are friends and I'll, Marla, I can take that one offline. I'm now the chair elect of UBED. So that's a, yeah, we can hash that one out. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. I hadn't heard of that. Yeah. I'm glad you are guys taking it offline because I have no idea how to. I have no idea. There's seven seconds. <laughs> can I offer a, a comment on the previous um, talent question? Yes, Absolutely. please, Marla. Yeah, so I, I was um, thinking that, you know, there's kind of three things that I see as an, an um, not issues, but present challenges is one, we don't have a really high profile exit or evidence of a founder reinvesting in the region. And I think that drives a lot of other communities to um, attract more talent as they see that there's been a success. Uh, and then two, I, I think there's some perceived friction in the ecosystem, whether it's real or not, um, it's perceived and that can draw people away from the region. And then the third thing is um, on the density aspect, you know, we don't have mass transit, we can't move people easily. And that's a really big factor. We we, we talk about it a lot, but uh, I think it, it actually is a deterrent in some ways. Good, great insight, Marlo. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Let me just kind of wrap up with one last question before we have to wrap things up here. But to the to the panel, what call to action would you ask this group? I mean, how can we external groups, how could businesses or how can people just play a, a bigger role in helping out with what you all are doing? I mean, we are always looking for um, partners and experts who can help us in all different aspects, whether it's mentoring, whether it's an advice or feedback about the technology, uh, which way to take it, whether it's valuable or not, and what, what things we should be looking at. Because we are all looking at it at one point of view, and maybe we are missing something. So it's always good to have fresh set of eyes, especially for someone who've been through it uh, similar. So any kind of help um, 
come and talk to us, first of all. Uh, there is so many things we can do together and we would love to have an initial conversation and see what your interest and what your expertise is and how can we match you with our needs. Yeah, I concur with that. I don't have uh, too much to add unless uh, you want to start up an investor group in our area. Yeah, similarly, I would say um, even if that's where the conversation starts with tech transfer, I think a lot of what you'll find because we are part of institutions, sometimes you might inadvertently solve some of your other problems too, whether it's, you know, workforce development or just yeah, a broader education for the existing workforce or training. I think there's there's a lot of angles in there. Um, and so I would say we're the tech transfer group is often a really good starting point because of the fact that we have to engage with sort of every level of the institution in the ecosystem. So we're, you know, we're we're friendly people. <laughs> Come say hi. Good, great. Well, let me, we've, we've taken care of the questions and answers. I appreciate that. Um, and oops, didn't do what I thought it was going to do. Sorry about that gang. Um, but the, uh, wanted just to update you on what's happening next. Uh, again, just a reminder for everyone. If, if you uh, want to know about our various initiatives, please go to our website, uh, rba777.com, connects.com. Um, remember that, uh, all of our webinars in this recording, uh, this uh, this webinar this afternoon uh, are recorded and they'll be available on our website uh, later this afternoon. A reminder that uh, next month on Wednesday, April the third, the first Wednesday of the month, we will have our next one about uh, Babylon Micro Farms. Uh, here, the Richmond based company that's creating some accessible indoor micro farming solutions. Again, we we can't have a webinar without thanking our uh, corporate sponsors. So thank you immensely to all of our corporate sponsors for. Uh, supporting our organization and and, the, and all the various initiatives that we're undertaking. Um, before I thank everyone, I just want to again thank uh, Magda again. Magda, big kudos to you for for uh, filling in at the last moment. Uh, Jason, thank you very much for all of your insights that you've provided me the last couple of weeks. And then finally to Kevin, uh, Kevin who had to catch a flight early this morning out of Richmond to. He's in some undisclosed location called Middle of America. Uh, but thank you for uh, trooping along and, and handling it. And thank you to everyone uh, for attending this afternoon's uh, webinar. A reminder, we'll hope to see you next month uh, on Wednesday, April the 3rd. Have a great afternoon.